in no way related to this inquiry, which is an attempt to get control of the screen and to invade the basic rights of American... Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lawson. Mr. American citizens, whether they be Protestant or Methodist or Jewish or Catholic... Mr. Lawson. The President of the United States said that anti-communism was American policy, and that scared the shit out of him, because the last thing they wanted to be called was un-American. Having flirted with the idea of being Americans for so long, they began to believe that possibly they were. I'm just hopeful, like I told you, Mr. Smith, in California, that perhaps out of this hearing, our Congress... Now came the moguls, who were out to prove their American patriotism. ...question to give us a policy how to handle American citizens who don't deserve to be, if they are communists, to get them out of our place. The ideology term, ideological terms, rather, ter termites, have burrowed into many American industries organizations and societies. Wherever they may be, I say, let us dig them out and get rid of them. My brothers and I will be happy to subscribe generously to a pest removal fund. We are willing to establish such a fund to ship to Russia the people who don't like our American system of government and prefer the communistic system to ours. Then you admit that there are or were communists or communist sympathizers in your own I don't know if they're communist sympathizers. I know they're un-American in their method. In your studio, you mean? In our studio, I think. Well, how do you... Do you mean un-American because they are communists? Or un-American because they're fascists? No, un-American because they endeavor to put certain things into scripts that, in my personal opinion, is un-American. And I... Uh, it's my business to see that it doesn't get in. It's my... If it, and, Eventually, does get a creep in, I cut it out. Well, well, there's, there's very little difference on whether a person is a communist or a fascist, so long as he's un American. Isn't that true? I, I am not qualified to answer but that. But you admit, though, there are some people in your studio that are un American. Yes, I admit that. The way the moguls buckled was they're, 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 the Cossacks are coming again. They were unsure of their status. A lot more unsure, say, than the next generation of who are writers, say, or directors or actors, you know, who who were born in America, and as I was, and uh, had no no confusion at all about being Americans. We were Americans and felt we had all the rights of Americans and uh, would fight for them when we could. I am against. Uh, I am. Uh, I speak. I am for everything that you said. Well, uh, so you uh, agree with that I statement? Agree. I agree wholeheartedly, and I... The uh, statement was a little long, and I... It was a I very good statement. Your... It's a statement of a real American. To appease UAC, the Mughals instituted a blacklist of studio talent. Years before, they had fled European anti-Semitism. But now in America, they became collaborators, helping anti-Semites rid Hollywood of Jewish intellectuals. In effect, they had surrendered control of the industry. If you look at the main factors in what caused the moguls' decline, I think you have to look at them psychologically and not to external factors. After all these years of commanding these studios, HUAC and other factors demonstrated to them that all the things they had dreamt about, all the hopes that they had had, all the emotion that they invested into their assimilation were really empty. 
It all seems so simple, Lince. Live your life, do your work. As simple as all that. You find out it's not that easy. Nothing comes free. One way or another, you pay for what you are. Yeah. After Hueck, the fight went out of the Hollywood Jews. They lost their hold on the studios they created. Like the Wizard of Oz, having been exposed as fearful refugees fleeing from themselves, they couldn't go on pretending to be moguls. There are many here to whom I owe a great vote of thanks. And I have appreciation in my heart. Without their aid, their loyalty and devotion, I would not be standing here taking the bow. He lived in 1957. He was fired in 1952. So the last five years of his life were heartbreaking. Very sad for me as a child to watch. Paced back and forth again. I don't want to extend the lion metaphor excessively, but all that energy was now confined to the home. I mean, that studio was his greater family, and he really couldn't bear it. And the pain was evident in his face, in his physical body language, in, in the anxiety in his voice, in his temper. It was just heartbreaking. As he approached death, Mayer fell back on religion, but not Judaism. He took religious instruction from Fulton J. Sheen, the leading exponent of popular Catholicism. According to some, Mayer was prepared to convert. His daughter Irene told him that people would scream with laughter at the news. He began to fear that even after death, he would be rejected. In the end, he was buried a Jew. Harry Cohn died a year later. His Gentile wife was with him at the end. Harry was in, on the, in the ambulance suffering from a massive heart attack and he had was in pain I, you know and he says oh Jesus Jesus Christ because of the pain from this heart thing so Joan says ah, Harry Harry my Harry you found Christ you know and so she converts him to Catholicism well on the sarcophagus where Harry there's a cross and a star on the sarcophagus and if Harry knew that and knew what Joan did he turned over in his grave <laughs> Harry Warner also died in 1958 of a stroke following a bitter argument with his brother Jack. Jack spent his last years in the south of France, playing the gentleman's game of chemin de fer and palling around with faded members of European royalty. He died in 1978 from injuries he received after falling while playing tennis. Carl Lemley did not live to see Huac and the end of the studio era. He sold out his interests in Universal in 1936, spent his last years close to his grandchildren, and died in 1939. But Paramount's Adolf Zukor, the first mogul, lived on, becoming a venerated relic of the past. His signature in cement, and then his hand and footprints. He is the first motion picture executive so honored. Alongside many screen immortals to whom he gave their first chance, go the imprints of Mr. Motion Pictures. Promoting Horatio Alger's American dream to the end, he died in 1976 at the age of 103. In this blessed land, we can go as far as we want. If we only put into practice Horatio Alger's deep and abiding faith in honesty, hard work, and decency. Horatio Alger knew that in the United States, every man can aspire to the stars. The moguls are gone, but their vision survives. The America of Edison and Rankin has given way to an alien ideology. It isn't the communism or Judaism that the Gentile elite once feared. It's Americanism, as defined by Hollywood. The icons endure. The little guy fighting the odds. The pogrom imagery the desperate desire to survive, and the various races assimilating to create 
the ultimate happy ending. I'm not Jewish. Nobody's perfect. A white middle class president articulating the Jewish experience writ large. A new global religion, Hollywoodism. Perhaps it's fate that today is the 4th of July and you will once again be fighting for our freedom. Not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution, but from annihilation. We're fighting for our right to live, to exist. And should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night, we will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. There was a Hollywoodism then. There's a Hollywoodism today. I would go further and say it is what is the ruling ideology of our culture. Hollywood culture is the dominant culture. It is the fantasy structure that we're all living inside. The things I see about me, the big things and the small, the little corner newsstand and the house a mile tall, the wedding and the churchyard, the laughter and the tears, the dream that's been a growing for a hundred and fifty years The town I live in The street, the house, the room The pavement of the city Or a garden all in bloom The church, the school, the clubhouse the million lights I see, but especially the people that's a man. 